Welcome to the MBA series. This is a special multi-part series within Next Economy Now. We are going to review the arc of the learning journey that is presented in the Next Economy MBA online course. We are open sourcing the content from our course and hope to share it in this shorter, bite-sized format. We are launching this series because we were asked to do it by listeners like you. We're also doing it because we are writing a book entitled The Next Economy MBA, Redesigning Business for the Benefit of All Life, which will be published on May 23rd, 2023 by Barrett Kohler Publishers. This is a sizable series. There will eventually be 18 podcast episodes of course content and nine interviews with MBA alumni. We will be rotating every other week with our normal Next Economy Now interview format. We hope you enjoy it. Please reach out to us via our website, lifteconomy.com, with any comments, feedback, or requests. And now, on with the show. Welcome back, everyone. This is Aaron Axelrod, a partner worker owner at Lift Economy, joined by... Hi, Sean Barry, also a partner worker owner at Lift Economy. Nice to be with you all today. And we're back because we didn't finish going through all the principles in our last podcast episode. So we went through principles one through five, and we are now going to take the time to go through principles six through 10. And just as a reminder for folks who might not have listened to those first principles, We use these principles, core principles developed over a decade of working with hundreds of social enterprises, nonprofits, and other organizations to help guide the emergent next economy that we are co-creating. And so they're principles that are helpful as tools to make decisions and to design organizational efforts to contribute to the growth of the next economy or the solidarity economy. And Sean, we reminded people last time how hard it is to achieve all of these 10 principles in one single entity or organization. In fact, we've, we haven't found one yet that does all 10 of these. And these are very aspirational, um, but we like to keep it aspirational to incentivize real, true, transformative systems change. And it is important to acknowledge that the business as usual economy operates around racialized capitalism and to dismantle and disrupt that at every opportunity. And these principles should be taken in that context as, as vehicles and tools for disrupting the exploitation of people and planet along racial lines that we see so rampant in our business as usual economy. Anything to add, Sean? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, just just adding an invitation for some some gentleness with yourself to not feel too overwhelmed and not expect everybody is, is expressing or, or working on implementing these all at once. Think of it more as uh, almost like a menu of the major impactful themes of the movement that we're seeing. Uh, part of what we're excited to share with you today is case stories of organizations doing just that. So think of it more of an invitation rather than something you should already be doing. So with that in mind, Sean, we have number six. Can you tell us a little bit about principle number six? What is it and how do you think of it? Yes. Thanks, Aaron. So number six is open sources replication. So there's there's a couple pieces in there. One one is open source. So this idea of if you as a individual or a team or a group uh, are creating a really important solution or innovation that helps humanity evolve into the future, that it's really we would like to invite you to share that and understand that there's a business as usual uh, practice of intellectual property, copywriting, and trademarking, and all that kind of stuff, and. I understand there's maybe good reasons for certain certain people or certain teams doing that, but there's also people that are giving away their solutions. And so again, it's it's, it's not a, a judgmental imperative that you have to, but just think about it. Think about all the people that came before us and all the wisdom that's been passed on to us so that we could have this creative moment to create a new solution. And then think about, do you really own that? <laughs> Does that really just belong to you? 
And that's, you know, again, that's okay if that's that's the way you want to hold it. But we see some groups sharing their solutions. And instead of trying to, you know, hold it and charge licensing fees and make profit off of it, the idea is let's let's deploy that solution. Let's get it out as far and fast as possible. So the one piece is the open source of, of sharing the information and the other piece is the replication. So especially if you've not only created a solution, but built a team around it or or a, or maybe even a network of teams, the idea is like, how do, how do we scale these solutions? So one, by open sourcing, that, that removes a barrier of we're sharing a solution already. But then if we could actually share the method of, of, of how we set up a, a business or an organization, and instead of scaling by accretion, by, by becoming one large entity that has centralized control over affiliate locations, actually scaling by replication. So giving the policies and procedures and strategies and all the organizational templates to another entity and then federate it as a network. So instead of one entity controlling the other, now we're basically replicating partners in the movement of deploying the solution. Anything to add on this one, Aaron? Well, I guess just to say that's all well and good, but who's actually doing this, Sean? Who is who is open sourcing? And can you share some of those examples? Yes, we would love to have a, a, a much bigger list, but I, I will share the story of Precious Plastics it is a very cool project. I believe it was started in France. And what they've done is created a method to either recycle or upcycle plastic, small scale plastic reprocessing and production inside a shipping container. And the whole thing was done with this concept in mind, not only to to create a needed solution, which is using an abundant resource, waste stream of plastic, but also doing it in, in with the foresight of making a, an easy model that could replicate and and then federating as a network. So what they're doing is they're taking a shipping container, kind of a standard ocean liner shipping container, and they have a, a plastics collection at one end and then a production line where the plastic gets ground down, gets, well, I think it, I think they might sort it into, you know, colors and types and such, and then grinding it into bits and then using that as a, a raw material to actually create products just right there. So they're things that you could think of, of melting plastic into. I'm trying to remember some of the things like climbing holds for a climbing gym or a, a lamp or furniture or, you know, anything that you could mold plastic into basically. And then, so you have this collection on one side and then this processing where you actually come out with finished goods and usable products on the other side. So that's the basic model but then there's a there's a community around the world there's a website and you can see which towns and which countries have one of these facilities and what they're doing and how they're doing it so this is this wonderful example of we could probably use one of these in every neighborhood to collect and upcycle plastic right on site so it's not sent you know overseas to a processing factory and and well and the truth is is most plastic is quickly downcycled right? And the plastic water bottle and it gets drunk and then it gets made into a carpet pad and then that gets landfilled. So you have this really quick down cycle to the, to the, to the landfill. Whereas this, you're actually taking that waste stream and without sending it off to somebody else, somewhere else, you're just making it into something yourself. So that's this beautiful example of this small scale upcycling and scaling by open source replication. I think one of the most common criticisms of this principle of open sources and open sources replication is companies concerned that they'll lose their kind of strategic positioning or core market competitive edge. Could you talk a little bit, Sean, to how how we've seen this enhance a company's bottom line and profit or, or even just help the company as opposed to become a liability? Well, one is it's a very different approach, but you're definitely creating a community. So you can think of how you would feel interacting with this type of community run business uh, versus a, a global supply chain that's looking to extract raw materials and profits for people who don't even live around here. So the, 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 the scale and the engagement is so much different. You know, you get to 
come in and make things with your own hands, bring your own plastic and make something, you know? So there's this very connected experience. So it's, it's probably true. You might get less dollars in revenue, but you might get community and a new skill. So the, the, the exchange is actually different. I mean, just to build on that, we've also seen it be the case that especially for companies that are kind of on this emergent early adopter space, especially around ecological design or new ways of working together as as humans, that the more they open source systems or information, they're actually using that as a way to build the market demand for their good or service. So we've seen ecological landscaping companies, um, when they open source information around how to build a gray water system or how to install a rainwater catchment tank, we've seen that actually a marketing strategy because there is still a considerable sizable market out there that is not going to go and build their own rainwater catchment system. And so they learn, they have the information accessible freely, but then they do end up coming to the company or enterprise to deliver the good or service, even with that access to of know how to how to do it themselves. Yeah. And that reminds me of folks who listened to the last episode, we ended with integrates education. So a lot of the principles kind of overlap and build and support on each other. So yeah, like I can imagine a precious plastics node that would could sell things for profit and, and employ people that I don't I don't have a you know, I don't see any, any problem with that either. The other advantage you get by this this uh, federated network is you've expanded the intellectual surface area. You have more minds, you have more intelligence working on the same project or concept and then sharing information as a network. So it really runs counter to this idea of like concentrating power and authority at the top of a, of a, of a long corporate decision chain. Just don't actually think that works as well as as getting everybody's minds engaged and in this case your hands engaged and then sharing those solutions out through that network so there's a lot of kind of advantage of this collective approach so that's number six open sources replication aaron what's what's next what's number seven great number seven is so timely this principle is embodies transparency So here we are looking, um, and this calls in that sort of self-compassion and gentleness that Sean was mentioning at the top there around, even if your enterprise or organization has not been able to implement every single thing on the laundry list of uh, perfect execution of next economy values or principles, transparency about where you're at, about where the state of the organization, the state of the entity is so critical. There's a lot of kind of posturing or positioning around having done more than we actually have in the business as usual economy. And we want to kind of get away from that and be upfront about the gaps and places where we are falling short So I'm actually going to give a case story that's very alive in the media right now. An example where I, there's some amount of transparency in this enterprise or initiative, but there's also some amount of transparency that I wish was more. (laughs) So Patagonia, Patagonia is a well-known outdoors wear company, uh, also a B corporation. And Patagonia has been certainly quite, quite, has had a lot of leadership in terms of their transparency around their supply chain. However, they have a ways to go with transparency as well. So one of the areas they've gotten a lot of media attention recently is Yvonne Chouinard gave away the profits of the company. So actually created a ownership structure where there's a perpetual purpose trust and that the beneficiary of all the profits of Patagonia, the company that's you know ten, tens of millions of dollars, hundreds of million dollars a year, goes to this stakeholder, which is a 5014C. Now, this nonprofit that's able to do policy making and is is has has um, ostensibly in the media has been talking about the the purpose of acting uh, in the benefit of the climate and of planet earth and stakeholders, we don't actually, 
I don't have transparency to the articles and bylaws and actual nuts and bolts of what is written into the perpetual purpose trust that describes the purpose of this uh, beneficiary. So that's one area where, wow, it's getting so much media attention. It's great that this billionaire is um, not keeping the profits to himself and to his own legacy. But I would love to see way more transparency around, okay, who are the beneficiaries um, written into this, this structure, this entity that has been structured to steward quite large sums of assets from this the company's profits. So a lot to say on transparency and certainly just disclosing uh, information do, does not of its own accord solve everything, but certainly uh, disclosing information is a vast course correction away from what we currently have, which is a lot of culture around not disclosing information about treatment of workers or profits or treatment of ecosystems, like a lot of a lot of backdoor dealing that keeps um, information about how goods and services are produced away from visibility of, of mainstream eye um, and and the people that are consuming those goods and services. Yeah, Aaron, that's a that's a that's a good case story because I see how it goes both ways, right? You, you're you're getting some degree of, of of transparency that's that's innovative and leading uh, the field, uh, but then also there's there's you, you kind of might want some more, right? That would be great. Of let's go all the way on on transparency and and um and, and really share more information, especially like you're highlighting there. That's a lot of resources going into this new trust structure. It, you know, similar to the the last principle, it's like, hey, let's open source and and replicate that this this idea of gifting into into perpetual trust to steward a, a, an essential purpose into the future. But since we don't know the details, we, we we don't know if that's the way that's set up or or not. Or what about the next billion dollar company that maybe is inspired by by the Schoenard family and they want to do this too? I mean, maybe they would share if they if you call them up or something. But yeah, it would be nice to kind of have that 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 leadership all the way all the way down. Well, they should go to Purpose Foundation, Derek Rezzo and Camille Cannon to find out because that organization has been um, at the helm of helping companies like Firebrand Bread structure as a perpetual purpose trust entity, where Firebrand Bread will continue delivering really high quality bread baked locally in Oakland. And will, in perpetuity, employ formerly incarcerated folks to break, bake that bread. So their mission is baked into that perpetual purpose trust structure. Yeah, and 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 the, for example, on the purpose website is that case story of how that trust is set up, so we know, you know, what what exactly is happening. So that they they are actually, you know, demonstrating that that degree of transparency we would love to have. Yay. So let's go to number eight, Sean. What's number eight? Number eight. I have to stop myself from every principle saying this is my favorite one, but uh, (laughs) I guess I like all these principles. So next economy principle number eight is regenerates systems. So what do you mean? You're, You're in business. Doesn't that mean you have to destroy the environment? That's like the premise of the business as usual economy. And it's just like, not only wrong, it's dead wrong, and it's really uncreative thinking. So this this principle flips it and says, no, let's actually design a business that by functioning and by prospering and thriving actually regenerates systems. And what do we mean by systems? Well, we could we could talk about ecosystems. So what about a business that causes an increase in biodiversity? that that uh, stimulates a flourishing of of natural systems and life and clean water and fresh air it's actually possible a simple case story and i'll, I'll go to a, a a a company case story but just just if we just think about agriculture well the the so-called green revolution was what the 1930s 40s 50s in the US before that green revolution all agriculture was regenerative agriculture. It wasn't a buzz term. It was just how you interacted with the earth to, 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 to grow food and meet your needs. And so this new green revolution came on and said, hey, let's spray everything with petrochemical uh, pesticides and fertilizers and we'll, 
will we ramp up production? Well, it's it's actually been a total failure. If we look at the the whole life cycle of cost of the pollution to the environment, you actually have higher loss to uh, predation and insects. You get lower yields, you get lower quality food, you get food that's polluted and has chemicals in it. So this idea that you're getting something better out of that approach to agriculture is just wrong. It's it's, it's not working better because all the ex, all the 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 harmful aspects are externalized from the the, the profit sheet of those, you know, the companies that are selling the pesticides or, or fertilizers. So this this just really calls us to 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 look at all the our spheres of influence when we're running an enterprise and think about how generative they can be. How how do we create more life? How do we create more benefit, mutual benefit? Yeah, I just want to share one thing as we go into this topic because for me there's a piece around acknowledgement and honoring that is missed oftentimes in popular culture when we talk about regeneration or regenerative agriculture. And I and I just want to name that a lot of the conversation um, erases and or marginalizes the contributions of Indigenous peoples and Indigenous lifeways and Afroecological worldviews and paradigms around this um, and oftentimes what's stopping <laughs> regeneration from happening is the uh, colonize the colonization approach that has really destroyed a lot of intact worldviews and paradigms that had right relationship and reciprocity. So even going back like previous to agriculture, indigenous ways of meeting human needs in so many different indigenous ecologies around the globe, we can point to Lakota tradition, Coast Miwok, Pomo, you know, so many native lands and native traditions where material culture was actually sourced in a way that by using a digging stick to source high starch corms and roots, it actually enhanced the ability for that plant to grow and become more abundant and more um, produce more food and more biodiversity and more ecosystem services for all of life. And so just just naming like the reason we call it the next economy and not the new economy is a lot of this is very, very old stuff that has been, you know, at the cost of people's lives and health it has been, you know, people have been brutally divorced from these methods and paradigms and worldviews. And um, our work is to as humbly as possible to like repair those harms and b- come back into balance, especially all of you know, many, so many of us have been divorced from indigenous worldviews. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for mentioning that. And I think, I think part of that is for people that don't have direct lived experience to that might not imagine how much abundance can come off a healthy system. I, I think it was when, I think when you interviewed Winona LaDuc and you asked her what gives her hope. And she's, I think she said something, I'm paraphrasing, but she said something like, you know, one zucchini seed will produce a plant that produces thousands of zucchini seeds. So, you know, you want to talk about return on investment. <laughs> are you kidding Grow me? some like, zucchini in your garden. <laughs> oh my goodness. Like natural systems are so abundant. And if we can partner with them, right, instead of try to subjugate them and extract a certain type of value, we can get so much abundance. So I'll, I'll go right into Soil Haiti as a case study for this. Soil Haiti is an organization in Haiti that I believe it formed as a response to, oh, and I might forget, there was a, I think it was a big hurricane or something a decade ago, and, and they had, uh, I think it was a, a cholera outbreak due to, to flooding and damage. And so in, in response to that, and part of the part of the reason for the, the outbreak was lack of sanitation. So dense, dense urban settlement and lack of uh, treatment facilities and flooding meant raw sewage spread throughout the city and then spread disease. So Soil Haiti is an innovation that that builds on this regenerative system that that looks at, you know, human waste as a resource, which it is, but not if it's in the wrong place, <laughs> they have a system of compostable toilets that are, are you know, easy, easily uh, portable. They have little hand carts and street carts and, and they go around collecting. I, they're using five gallon buckets like you would see at the hardware store and, you know, put a toilet seat lid on there. 
put a deposit, you put some wood chips. It's actually pretty, you know, pretty simple, easy system. You pick the, the then the, the team goes around, picks those up, takes them back to a processing facility and makes really high quality uh, organic compost out of it, which then they take to grow more food in local farms. And then they employ you know, a whole staff of people that get to, you know, have, have right livelihood and, and, um, stable employment and they're, they're, you know, keeping their, their neighborhood clean. And they're providing this, again, this abundant yield of rich fertilizer to grow more food for more nutrition and healthy, fresh vegetables. So you can see it, it, it creates this generative cycle of, of co-benefits. So it's not just that, there's less disease on the street after a flood, which is the, you know, the original problem they're solving for. But by taking this regenerative system approach, uh, they're creating multi yields of abundance. I got to squeeze in one more fun example. And, and also knowing that the reason we call this regenerates systems is because a lot of this has to do with regenerating people systems as well. So, you know, some of the principles we mentioned around democratizing ownership and democratizing governance is part of rebalancing and regenerating our people systems where, you know, so many of us have just been trained out of having ownership of the work that we do or having profit from the work that we do. And so this principle, it's not just the ecosystems around us, but having people also be, be interfacing in a system where they're actually getting the benefit. They're they're being regenerated themselves um, and nourished by the work they're doing. And one example that comes to mind that's uh, related to Soil Haiti is Recompose. This is an amazing initiative based out of Seattle that has actually legalized forms of processing human bodies into nutrient-dense soil and compost um, that can then be applied on wildlands and nature preserves because so there's so much toxicity right now in the way that the U.S. context does death care where we pump bodies full of formaldehyde and toxins and then use a lot of concrete and cement to create burial grounds. And so there's a, there's a growing movement to transform that into right relationship with death and having recompose as an institution, offering people the choice to um, transform the bodies of their loved ones and that process of grief, embracing all sides of grief, which is grief and celebration and nourishment for the next generations. So it's another fun example of this regenerates systems. Yeah. And I like the, one of the options with that is when your loved one is, goes through the process, then you can actually plant a tree from their body you know it's that's pretty amazing and talk about regenerating systems so now you have a a fruit tree or a shade tree or whatever it is that that you could actually is embodying that that person that you're connected to so it can go pretty deep on 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 how how much benefit is created yeah and from the people system side of it too you know we've had the privilege of talking to Katrina Spade the founder of Recompose and one of the things she talks about often is just how the the process of in families engaging in this decision making around how to honor the life of their loved one mm-hmm. in a way that also nourishes all of life and 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 really is in deep integrity with the cycle of life has been transformative for people in terms of changing their relationship with death and that's like the kind of hidden value in what she's talking about. And it goes back to this principle of regenerating systems, like how people have re- had to relate to death because of so many different reasons. Her recompose is actually helping repair that and, and, and have a different way of relating to death and life. And, um, you know, that's another co-benefit of her work. So many levels, right? This physical, mental, spiritual, like it's pretty, pretty amazing how, how that, translates to so many levels really beautiful all right Aaron what's number nine ready to build some movements (laughs) (laughs) so number nine builds movements I want to share a story from one of our MBA participants we just did session 14 which is financial systems and one of our MBA participants asked how do we utilize operating models and financial 
vehicles as a mechanism to build power? And I thought that was just such a beautiful question um, coming from our, our MBA student in our current cohort. And so we really hold this as a, a very, very important principle. It was actually a principle that I think in cohort two or cohort three, we actually added this principle because um, the lift team noticed that we had this massive gap where we were talking about enterprises individually, as opposed to how enterprises fit in, wedge themselves into larger systems transformation. So this principle really honors the feedback of our Next Economy MBA participants and the conversations that we're having in our MBA course. So, you know, just to name, businesses have such significant influence on government and society, particularly in the business as usual context. So much of our governmental systems and infrastructure are actually influenced by lobbying from businesses that forestalls regulation, lobbying that marginalizes competition, that captures market control. There's the business as usual economy is fortified, talk about agriculture, by subsidies and tax breaks. Look at corn, look at soybean production, trade policies, regulations. There's there's all these aspects of the system that create the conditions for the business as usual economy to flourish. So in meeting that, we as next economy change makers and practitioners, we need to also be thinking in terms of policies um, and interventions that can create power. And so there's so many organizations that are doing this work in solidarity economy. There is, uh, there are institutions like the U.S. Federation of Worker Cooperatives. There is national networks like the American Sustainable Business Council that can propel sort of a movement building approach. But I wanted to share one really cool project that I think is also in embodying the systems change or movement building approach, and that is the Participatory Budgeting Project. So whereas this is a nonprofit organization, their, their kind of next economy enter intervention is to create systems that empower people to decide together how to spend public money. So they create participatory budgeting processes that deepen democracy. And they've supported governments, public institutions, and organizations to launch these participatory budgeting processes to the tune of having allocated, I think, something like 300, almost 400 million in public funding allocated through participatory budgeting processes. So they're really looking at scaling up these principles of governance, democratic governance, into kind of creating pathways for people to have a say of how money is spent in public institutions. And we could imagine enterprises or, or um, entities, you know, using their philanthropic dollars to support institutions like Participatory Budgeting Project or to um, mobilize campaigns that build power, um, grassroots power. And that's really what this principle is speaking to. And um, we love it when, when people are sending in examples of power building that agencies or organizations are undertaking. Thanks for that, Aaron. Yeah, and I would just add that it, it, it's hard to run a small little next economy business by yourself, right? Folks might even be listening to all these principles and say, wow, this is really overwhelming. How am I going to do all this stuff? Don't do it yourself. Let's do it together, <laughs> right? So like, you know, even, even a smaller example um, was when I, when I had my woodworking cooperative, we actually sent a representative and to the founding of the United States Federation of Worker Co-ops. And so now there's a national network that is a 501c4 that advocates for worker cooperative creation. And that was founded almost 20 years ago. And now look at now we have way more worker co-ops than, than we used to have. They're reporting uh, about a thousand worker co-ops in the United States before they were founded. It was more like three or four hundred. So small can be really powerful. So even even if you're as opposed to just doing something yourself, even if you just get a strategic partnership with just one other organization and, and you're starting to work together, uh, it, it can be a huge, huge benefit. So 
yeah. And as Aaron said, you know, this is our thinking evolves over time. And this is something that was, a, you know, a gap in our in our principles that feels like a really important addition to think, think about the, 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 the larger movement instead of just the individual organization. So, Sean, at the end of the day, we're, we're getting close to principle 10. At the end of the day, it all comes back to the people. Can you tell us about developing people, an or- organizational principle that develops people. Yeah. So next economy principle number 10 develops people. Yeah. This idea that, uh, especially in, 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 in America, like the education system just really grooms us to be a compliant workforce, right? Doesn't really teach you to, uh, think critically for yourself or to take care of all your human needs, like nutrition or, or healthcare or, you know, preventative medicine. Um, it really just focuses you on, you know, reading and writing and following orders and doing well on tests and preparing yourself for a career where you get to go off and trade your labor for enough American dollars so that you can, you know, get your 30 year mortgage and put in a nice career so that somebody else gets some profit. And then maybe you have a retirement. <laughs> ay, ay, ay. No, life is so much more precious and beautiful. So instead of thinking of what can we extract from people, thinking of as a business, how do we develop people? How do we invest in people as our core resource and our even core purpose for existing? And so, of course, we have to meet people where we're at, where they're at, but we want to invest and lift them up and, you know, grow, grow together. So what does this mean for a business? You know, it might sound like perks or benefits or something, but what it means is actually expecting to invest in the workforce as an ongoing collaborative effort to, to grow and evolve everybody on, you know, basically every level on their skill, on, you know, whatever their role is, you know, people are incredibly intelligent and they they have things that they love to do. So what does each person love to do and what's the best role for them to really excel and bring their gifts? And people have friction with each other. So let's invest in communication and compassion and, you know, how do, how do we make decisions together? How do we work together? This is all predicated on really investing not just attention, but, but resources and, um, you know, helping people advance and also on their agenda. What do, what do they want to grow and develop as? Not, not the company says you have to do something, but um, really kind of inviting people to find that, that own spark and fire inside themselves of what, what, what are their gifts? How, how can they bring them out? How can the company support you? Well, in a minute, I'm going to ask you to share an example, but one, one of the ways that, 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 that we do it on our team is just like our review process. Uh, is we think of that as as actually um, investing the company's resources to support each person on the company to to grow and evolve as a person. It's not just a, a checklist of you know are you performing well on on your job description. It's like what's alive in you. What do you think you did well on? What do you think you could improve on? How can we support you? How can the team support you? Uh, what do you need? Do you need some training? Do you need some coaching? Do you need some therapy? Because we're going to invest in you because you're our most most valuable resource. And what we see, not not just uh, uh, people being inspired and bringing their best to work, but it creates a really warm team. And then a really warm team can solve all kinds of problems together. So it's uh, on the long tail, <laughs> you actually do get a, a more productive a more um, you know high functioning workforce, but it is an investment. So, Aaron, I'd love to hear any any thoughts that you have, and also you know of a case story if you want to share that. Yeah, I think it's just worth mentioning that one of the most significant factors we see for the dissolution or breakdown within organizations is around culture and around um, divisiveness or conflict or, you know, big, big explosions when, when companies don't invest in developing people. And so this principle is really around making sure that culture stays front and center in the um, development of the organization and the entity. And culture starts with, with the people. 
that are a part of that organization. And so I want to share about the East Bay Permanent Real Estate Cooperative. Um, They're a really inspiring example of a multi-stakeholder cooperative that's owned not just by the worker, the staff owners, but also by their housing cooperative. So they acquire property and take it permanently off of the speculative real estate market, particularly with an emphasis on Black and Indigenous, person of color-led community properties um, that are then stewarded collectively by the cooperative uh, to provide uh, perpetually affordable housing for those communities. And they're based in a region of the San Francisco Bay Area, unceded Ohlone territory that is really suffering from gentrification and displacement, especially for Black and Brown communities. When they think about some of the practices that the East Bay Permit Real Estate Cooperative employs to develop the people of the organization is restorative justice practices. So when they look at you know developing people and looking at when conflict emerges in, in the organization, they actually spend energy and resources with mediation, with conflict skill building processes and practices so that the organiz- the people of the organization ha- are developing, actually when they're at work, they're learning how to be more present with conflict as it emerges and how to resolve conflicts. And that's both in the staff workers, but then also in the tenants. Um, so the, the tenant owners, the resident owners of the cooperative are also trained up in restorative justice and how to resolve conflict in their housing collectives. Another example would be um, their attention on nonviolent communication training. So they practice at their staff meetings, they practice regular and periodic training in communication approaches, which include nonviolent communication, which is a system of really helping staff owners identify their needs and their requests and strategies for expressing their needs and requests to one another in a way that is um, nonviolent so that people can learn new modes of operating that are um, less kind of coercive or punitive and more, more embracing of a plurality of needs and how do we meet collective needs. Um, one of the things, one of the biggest kind of criticisms we often get around the cooperative movement is, oh, that's totally inefficient. Or, oh, that's that's not going to work because it takes too much time to get people in a room to all agree on something. And w- w- our, our posit is that the reason why we see so many breakdowns and inefficiencies in cooperative movements sometimes is because most of us spend our lives with zero training in how to collectively make decisions. So we're all starting with a deficit (laughs) in terms of our skill set around like, how do we negotiate different people's needs and desires and wants? And and it'll take some time to rebuild those skills. And so our posit is that um, next economy organizations must invest energy and that the payoff is really huge when we're investing in people because over time, those people become really effective collective decision makers, really self-aware with their ability to express their needs um, in a way that doesn't alienate or make others feel shameful or bad. And that that is critical infrastructure for having a democracy that actually works on a societal level. Wow. Thanks, Erin. Hearing these examples, it just warms my heart to know that people are at work doing beautiful work and then being invested in, in, in these ways, you know. And yeah, it gives me a lot of hope. It gives me a lot That's of hope really for exciting. the future. Yeah. yeah. Well, thanks, Aaron, and, and thanks everybody. Those those are our ten principles of the next economy. And just a, a few words in, in conclusion. Um, and we said it earlier, but just to say it again, it's a lot. And we don't we don't see any organization, you know, investing perfectly in all these. We actually do see some organizations that you, you can point to each principle and how they are expressing it, but uh, we all have a long way to go. There's there's plenty of work uh, for everybody in the next economy. So, you know, come on over, <laughs> get involved. We need you. 
And and you also might be thinking, yeah, how am I going to run a business, you know, when I'm investing in all these things? Because it's actually cost. And it's very true. It's it's a very hard problem. It does, you you will be operating at a higher cost basis. And the market is still expecting goods and services at whatever the market levels are. So it, it's really tricky. We can't tell you it's easy. We don't have all the solutions. Uh, we do have a framework called the price parity paradox that we'll go into in our training uh, in some more detail of of some strategies to navigate it. But it's really hard and it takes a lot of creativity. And that's why we need to empower all these intelligent people to come together, develop themselves, you know, uh, participate dem- democratically so that we can come up with the the innovative solutions that we need. So, Aaron, any any last words for our listeners today? Just that it's a marathon, not a sprint. And um, we would love to hear your thoughts, organizations that you feel are embodying any of the principles that we shared either in the last podcast or in this one. You can reach out to us on our website. Um, You can comment in the show notes. um, And we would love to hear from you examples of companies or enterprises or nonprofits that uh, organizations that you feel are really embodying and and, uh, innovating in terms of these principles. All right. Thanks, everybody. See you next time. Next Economy Now is a production of Lyft Economy. To listen to all of our episodes, go to lifteconomy.com slash podcast. That's L-I-F-T economy.com slash podcast. You can also sign up for our monthly newsletter at lifteconomy.com slash newsletter. Please also rate and review our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening.